I would uh, request you to comply with those rules unless you want the court to adjourn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Worship. On the 4th of April, 2024, we are in Pretoria Magistrates Court before Magistrate Ms. A. Wastazen, I am B. F. Manyati, the lead prosecutor, with Ms. D. Ramsami, the interpreter, if required, is Mr. T. A. Makita, and for the defense is Mr. K. Phillips, instructed by attorney Mr. May. Thank you. Please, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the record, uh, uh, Mrs. Mapisa Magula has indicated to Mr. Makita that she would speak both Isi Kosa and English. Thank you, sir, for your record as interpreter. May my learned friend confirm his appearance before I proceed? Thank you, Mr. Kerr Phillips. Yes. Thank you. May I proceed? Uh, thank you. Your Worship, the charges against Mrs. Mapisa Nagula are 12 counts of corruption under PRECA and one of money laundering under poker. It is common cause that the charges fall within Schedule 5 of the Criminal Procedure Act and the onus is on the applicant to satisfy the court by adducing evidence that the interest of justice permit a release on bail. That is Section 6011B. Your Worship would look at the schedule to the charge sheet. It's on page 4. And on page 2, the last paragraph 11, the prosecution has set the basis why it, 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 it falls within the ambit of section 51, subsection 2, and part 2 of schedule 2 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act and also Schedule 5, in that it, involve, it involves amounts of more than 500,000 rand. Your Worship, I am required by law, in terms of Section 60, Subsection 2D, to place on record why the prosecution is not opposing bail. However, given that the onus is on the applicant, to satisfy this court, may I ask that I give my reasons after they have set out their case? You might. Thank you. Uh, lastly, before they proceed, we have had sight of uh, the applicant's affidavit in support of her bail application. It comprises 46 pages, Your Worship. Uh, I propose in the interest of time uh, in addition to the 46 pages, there are also annexures. I propose, obviously my learned friend has the final discussion, that he does not read everything. There, there are a lot of aspects relating to policy and case law. I propose that he, he, he reads into the record uh, that which is pertinent to the personal circumstances and relevant aspects that are meant to persuade this court to uh, admit the applicant to bail. Otherwise, uh, I, I foresee that we will be here till the end of the day. That is definitely not in their interest because I would like this matter to be finalized today, given that the prosecution is not opposing bail. Obviously, the affidavit will form part of the record. So, so there can be no harm if, if some aspects are not read. I hear you. Thank you. Lastly, Your Worship, I, I just place this on record. Your worship is not required by law to actually bring it to the attention of Mrs. Mapisa Nagula, but I'll read the relevant section. It's section 60, 
11 capital B subsection C which reads as follows the record of the bail proceedings excluding the information in paragraph A your worship that would relate to previous convictions and pending cases shall form part of the record of the trial of the accused following upon such bail proceedings so I am recording this uh, to make it clear that the affidavit that will be handed in on her behalf will form part of the record and may be used by the state at trial stage. Thank you. Your Worship, lastly, ultimately, we will ask Your Worship, not today, uh, to, to transfer this matter to the High Court where the trial will be held. Thank you. Thank you. I took it. Can I hear you on the aspects raised um, by the state? My Insofar as the issue of onus is concerned, Your Worship, um, these are my instructions. We do not agree to the quantum, obviously. Um, so, um, in order to facilitate the swift proceedings of, these, of this matter, we do not mind beginning, but we uh, do not concede the amount. So, it puts us in a difficult position, and the way that we have so to deal with the position is to say, forget about the amount, we'll start it. And there can be no prejudice to any of the parties in court if we do that. It is so noted. Insofar as the, my learned friend's gracious offer that sections of the affidavit can be considered read, um, it's, a, it's a genius de, de, um, um, suggestion, and I embrace it. We will do it. <coughs> Insofar as the bail rec record being part of the criminal proceedings in trial and the state could use it for cross-examination, um, obviously that cuts both ways, so can we. And the, the point of the matter is that is the legal position, so I'm not going to quarrel with it. Indeed. Sh should I begin reading the affidavit? You might proceed. Thank you, sir. I'm going to hand up the original copy to, to your worship. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As it pleases the court, Your Worship. It, first and foremost, um, Your Worship, my client has signed, or initialed rather, on, on every single page with her Commissioner of Oaths, and she's signed and taken the oath um, insofar as it relates to this affidavit on the very last page. Paragraph 1 starts. I am a major female parli parliamentarian holding tenure as Speaker of the National Assembly of Parliament residing at 8 Adolf Kurz Street, Rumer, Johannesburg. I am an accused applicant herein and I make this affidavit of my own free will and have not in any way been unduly influenced to depose thereto. The facts herein are, save where stated or appears otherwise from the context with my, within my own personal knowledge, and are true and correct. Where I make legal submissions, I do so on advice which I've received, which I deem correct. <clears throat> Introduction. I seek me from this honorable court to be released on bail. I respectfully submit and I will de demonstrate herein there is no threat to the interests of justice should I be released on bail. The dictates of fairness and justice militate strongly against any deprivation of my liberty. The weakness of the case against me failed, fails to meet any threshold that would justify any limitation of my constitutional rights in any way and therefore I should be released on bail. I have not consulted fully with my legal representatives. This is not possible as, not having been given disclosure, I do not know exactly what the case is against, against me is, save for media reports which the state have indicated as accurate and which give, given their nature, could only have emanated from someone within the National Prosecuting Authority, in short the NPA, who is au fait with the doctor. 
while I have nothing to hide, I will record only that which I'm advised to record, having proper regard to my constitutional rights, both to remain silent and to be informed of the charge against me with sufficient detail to answer it. Accordingly, I invoke my right to re remain silent until I've been fully apprised of the case I have to meet, until my legal representatives have had the benefit of disclosure. In advising me, and, un and until I have had the benefit in instructing them. As a consequence, I will not answer the allegations leveled against me, such as I know them, save to state that I will address them at the appropriate time and in the appropriate forum. Where I do comment on the allegations and charges, I do so on the basis of the information disclosed by the state representative themselves via the press, and I do on the basis of the factual plausibility and legal sustainability of these allegations and, char and charges such as I discern. In this affidavit, I deal with my personal circumstances, the weakness of and difficulties for this the case against me, my constitutional rights, the duties of investigation which rest on the state representatives, the conditions in prisons where I will be held, any allegations leveled against me insofar as they're known to me, and the factors to be considered by the Honourable Court as contained in section 64 to 9 of Act 51 of 1977, the Criminal Procedure Act. Personal circumstances. I am a South African citizen. I attach here to a copy of my identity document marked NMN1 in verification of the above. I have resided in the Republic of South Africa all my life, save for six months in exile from 1984 to 1990, and I have made the conscious and determined decision to live in South Africa. Residence and property. I live at 8 Adolf Gurtz Street, Bruma, Johannesburg. The property is valued at approximately 7 million. It carries a bond of approximately 2 million. Family ties to the community and the Republic. I reside at the above mentioned address with my husband, Charles Nakula. I also have two sons, Siksole Nakula and Abongil Nakula, and four grandchildren whose names I shall note from this application all of whom reside in Johannesburg and who I would not leave by evading my trial. Employment. I am a major female parliamentarian presently holding tenure as the Speaker of the National Assembly and Parliament. My employment is the only source of income. When my employment comes to an end, I will go on pension. I need to break off immediately, uh, Your Worship, and inform you of the following. At the date of deposition of this affidavit, um, I understand my instructions from my client that these submissions are correct. Subsequently, she has told me that she has or will be resigning. <coughs> Further assets and liabilities. I will receive a state pension, which I cannot afford to lose and would lose if I evade my trial. I am not a flight risk, as simply I have too much to lose. The state representatives have admitted that this is their view as well by the admissions they have made recently in an application before the High Court at Pretoria to the effect that I'm not a flight risk and they will not be opposing my bail. Consequently, I submit that I present no flight risk and there was no reason to arrest me to ensure that I stand trial. I embrace the legal system and will abide by any finding that a court will make against me. I tender my cooperation with the investigation officer the South African Police Service, SAPS, and the National Prosecuting Authority, NPA, and to voluntarily make myself available at all hearings of this matter. I have voluntarily come to court today. My legal representatives have explained the following provisions of the Criminal Procedure Act, and then the, the relevant sections are listed at paragraphs 22.1 to 22.7. I place the following facts on record. I have no previous convictions. I am already quite mature, and thus my past history shows that I do not have a propensity to commit crime, and I am not aware of any other criminal investigations against me, 
and I'm not on bail in any pending, any pending or any um, or are there any criminal charges against me? The weakness and difficulties of the allegations against me. Though I have not been furnished with the charges with the state intends putting to my legal representatives, <clears throat> based on the press the report I referred to below, that possible charges may be brought against me relating to the allegations of corruption. We need to place on record once again, Milady, we, Your Worship, rather, we have been given the charge sheet today and I will uh, refer to it in due course. Thank you. I have mentioned above, by virtue of press reports which could only emanate from leaks from someone in the NPA, with insight into the docket. I have gleaned some insight into the weaknesses of the state's case. In demonstrating to this court now that the state's case is exceedingly weak, I rely on the following news reports. An article published by the Sunday Times on the 3rd of March 2024, which I annex as NMN2. I pause to mention that, it, that this exhibit was indicated to my attorney as a nearly verbatim account of the main witness whose evidence was obtained using section 204 of the CPA. This witness is also called, sorry, an article published by News24 on the 30th of April, which I annex as NMN3, and an article published by the Sunday World on the 31st of March, which I annex as NMN4. In NMN2, the Sunday Times reported that a witness identified as Nombasa Nonswanda Nondlovu, the 204 witness, had made a statement under Section 204 of the CPA alleging that between 2016 and 2019, while Minister of Defence, I solicited cash bribes from her for contracts or tenders with the South African National Defence Force, the SANDF. I deny this, that there was a, a case of fraud against the 204 witness arising from an investigation by military police into whether her husband played a role in securing these contracts with the SANDF which was struck from the role shortly after the Section 204 statement was given. In NMN3, News24 reported that the fraud case against the 204 witness amounted to roughly 100 million, which case had been struck from the role of, of the Specialized Commercial Crimes Court, that the case against the 204 witness included the use of false documents in the application for a tender and the use of false documents in claiming expenses spent in carrying out the contract and that the NPA would not give me any information as to what the 204 witness was promised in exchange for her testimony. That the NPA allegedly had WhatsApp messages apparently relating to wigs which they will allege was actually code for bribes which I deny. That the search and seizure carried out at my, no, my home had not found items which could corroborate the 204 witness version, including certain handbags which were never found, and a brown bear claw rug alleged to have been brought into the country illegally, which I deny, though it is unclear how this relates to any charge of corruption, which was also not found. That while I was Minister of Defence, played no part in the tender adjudication process, the state would argue that it's immaterial whether I actually did anything in return for any alleged gratification, which I deny receiving. In NMN4, the Sunday World reported, the present ANC Chief Whip, Ms. Penny Marjandina, has said that I had to be charged so that the ANC could affect the so-called step-aside rule resulting in my being removed as Speaker of the National Assembly. A leaked message had alleged that Ms. Monjondina was at the centre of the leakages and abuse of state power to humiliate and embarrass the Speaker, that is, me. I mention also that the supporting affidavit for the search and seizure warrant briefly sets out the state's case against me. This affidavit refers during the investigation, a number of discoveries made, which in summary has been documented as evidence in the case docket as follows. A company named Uncombe Marine, PTY Limited, was registered and incorporated as a company with the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, the CIPC, with registration number 212 slash 
The said Nondlova is listed as the sole director of Nkombe, and Nkombe was awarded a number of contracts during the time when Nkakula was the Minister of the, of the Department of Defense and Military to Veterans. Between December 2016 and July 2019, Nakulu formed a corrupt relationship with Nondlova, and Nondlova, upon receipt of various payments made to Nkombe by the DOD, made several payments to Nkombe. Kakula, amounting to 2,150,000 rand. As a result, 12 offences were committed by Nkakula in terms of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act 12 of 2004, PRECA. Nedlova, in addition, gave item 1 and 2, which are listed in the Annexure A attached to this application, to Nkakula, namely a Ted Baker lady's handbag and a Sarab bag, neither of which were found during the search. Item 3, which is listed in Annexure A, was alleged to have been brought into the Republic of South Africa illegally by Nkakula and will have to be subjected to further investigation upon seizure thereof. A bear claw rug, also never found in the search. Item 5, which is listed in Annexure A, relate to the documents which regard to renovations which were carried out at 8 Adolf Gord Street, Brummer, Johannesburg, Gauteng, using the gratification pay. It is quite clear, therefore, that the sole and only evidence against me emanates from the 204 witness, and is thus evidence of a single witness and an informer who, in all probability and likelihood, gave evidence in return for the fraud charges against her being allowed to be struck from the roll. The evidence is subject to several cautionary rules of evidence, a single witness, an informer, and an accomplice or co perpetrator cautionary rule. The 204 witness evidence was not corroborated by the search and seizure evidence, save for one wig, of many, which was seized and is of a generic nature that proves nothing except that I have worn a wig. I do not know how or why that wig, of many I have, was chosen for seizure. There is a suggestion of political motive for the prosecution against me, given the step-aside rule and the timing of the prosecution. <coughs> Litigation pending my handing myself over. There has been suggestion that by bringing an urgent application in the Pretoria High Court for disclosure of the full docket, I have abused court process and that I am attempting to evade justice. This is not true all correct. Firstly, I have the constitutional rights under Section 32 to have access to any information held by the state and under Section 34 to have any dispute that can be resolved by the application of law decided in a fair public hearing before, court, before a court. The fact that I sought to vindicate these rights and expose what I perceive is a malicious prosecution based on weak evidence does not result in the inference that I've attempted to evade justice. On the contrary, I submit this demonstrates my commitment to the truth. After all, since the state's investigation is, on the state in, uh, state's representative version, complete and ready for trial, there would be no prejudice to them making disclosure before I appeared. Secondly, the fact that I have now willingly handed myself over on, a, on arrangement with the NPA would indicate that I have not in fact attempted to evade justice. The extent, the extent urgent application before the High Court in Victoria will be removed from the role as I am now before this court. At this point in time, I am not aware of exactly which witnesses the state will be relying on to prove its case besides the 204 witness. Whilst this is so, I give the undertaking that I will not make contact with him, with her at any time until the finalization of this matter or any time thereafter. I have no interest in contacting her, nor now or ever, and will not do so. I have no intention of interfering with any witnesses in this matter. The Honourable Court may make this a condition of my bail that I do not make such contact. The evidence is in the custody of the investigation office. I am advised that a consequence of this fact is that the integrity of this evidence remains under lock and key, and there is no prospect that I could interfere with this evidence, and in the event that I wish to, which is denied. I maintain good 
relationships with people and I bear no grudges, grudges against anyone and am not a violent person. My imprisonment will affect the well-being of my family in circumstances where I'm detained for whatever reason. The reputational damage to myself and my family will never be repaired. There is no prospect on the facts that are known to me that if I were released on bail that I would undermine or jeopardize the objectives of the proper functioning of the criminal justice system, including the bail system, even if I wanted to, which is denied. It cannot be shown that I have a disposition to commit crime. My release on bail cannot, on the facts known to me, disturb the public order or undermine the public peace or security. I embrace the legal system and will comply with any bail conditions the Honourable Court might find fitting to impose. If there were a conviction, which prospect I deny, the sentence, if imposed, would more than likely be non-custodial. Any bail conditions that are imposed will be abided by me since the material loss of my not being so would be a price too high for me. I have no knowledge of any evidence which may re exist with regard to these investigations which may assist the state's case. I, in any event, believe that any such evidence which may exist is in the possession of the police and safely secured. I have no access to any evidentiary material which may be pre presented at the trial by the state, which I, <coughs> I may tamper and undertake that I will cooperate with any issues the state representatives may require. I am advised that an investigation pertaining to the alleged corruption usually involves the following statements. A statement from the complainant, in this instance the 204 witness, which has already been secured, various formal statements, and a statement or statements from the investigation officer. A perusal of this list indicates that, by now, in order to launch this charge in the first place, the state representatives must be of the view that they can show sufficient and admissible evidence to prove a reasonable prospect of a successful prosecution. They have admitted this fact in the recent High Court litigation. I do not admit that this is the true position or that it will ever be the true position. The state investigation must, save for the evidence of some experts perhaps, which is who there is no possibility I could know about, already be completed to satisfy this test. The prosecution has confirmed as much in writing under oath. Thus, there is no prospect that I could interfere with state witnesses or evidence to be led by the state in the event that I wanted to, which wish I do not hold, and the evidence, if any, is in the custody of the state. I'm advised that the consequence of this fact is that the integrity of this evidence remains under lock and key, and there's no prospect that I could interfere with this evidence in the event that I wish to, which wish I do not hold and deny. I can have no effect on the investigation of this matter at any stage of the trial, and my continued incarceration would not assist the state at all. It would, however, hamper my preparation for trial. Accordingly, I'm not a flight risk, and there's, there will be no risk that I would be prepared to forfeit my freedom or any bail award awarded by this Honourable Court or risk my freedom if I am released on bail. In summary, the integrity of the state's case, provided the state representatives take proper care of it, is inviolate. Having said this, I need to state categorically that I have no wish to interfere with the state's case. I embrace the legal system and will abide by any finding of this court or any other honourable court. I submit that the interests of justice do not require my incarceration. I am advised that a period of time will elapse before this matter is brought to trial. For example, I am advised that it is not unusual that three years pass before a matter like this is brought to finality. This has the following result if I remain in custody. The preparation of my defence will be impeded. I will suffer serious, phys serious physical harm for the reasons stated below. I will be treated as a guilty person when in fact I am innocent. As is more fully dealt with below, apart from being denied of my freedom, I will be physically at risk when I am in custody. It is respectfully submitted that any harm that I may suffer far outweighs any inconvenience such in, in, inconvenience is denied since I offer my full cooperation as stated above. 
which the state may suffer. I'm advised that such inconvenience to its investigation that the state may suffer is not a basis for a refusal of bail. Now, Your Worship, it, starting at paragraph 55, I now rely on my learned friend's um, gracious offer that I do not go through those sections. I will merely address what they say. These sta starting at page 19, these standing orders and prosecutorial regulations stipulate the obligatory approach which the SAPs and the prosecution must take when the issue of arrest and the issue of bail is decided. They are a team which is jointly accountable for their conduct to the Honorable Court, who must exercise judicial oversight over their conduct and correct it when it is flawed. The court cannot merely rubber stamp their conduct. This is dealt with in greater detail below. The prosecutor in each matter is the senior partner of the team and must regulate the conduct, conduct of the SAPs. It is unnecessary to give an exhaustive account of all the rights a South African citizen which are infringed by an arbitrary act or arbitrary acts of arrest and prosecution. It suffices to say that each of the decisions made by the SAPs and the NPA are administrative law decisions which either are bound by the provisions of the Promotion of Administrative, Administrative Justice Act 3 of 2000 or by the constitutional principles of legality or the rule of law. In each instance, representatives of the state who exercise power in terms of the statute and subordinate le legislation must act rationally and reasonably and free from the accusation of arbitrary or male fide conduct. In each instance, representatives of the authorities must provide reasons at an administrative law standard for their conduct and must disclose evidential proof for the nature of their conduct. These reasons are stored in the, in the various sections of the document. The Honourable Court, in turn, must seek out these reasons so that it may make an informed decision. This it does by ordering the full disclosure of the docket, that is, all its sections which house this evidence, or it must call the investigation office itself, if necessary, to secure all the evidence in order to make a safe decision. The essential entrenched constitutional rights will now be outlined. The departure point is that, the, is that these constitutional rights are not mere witticisms on the back of a bubblegum wrapper. Further, the prosecution and the police cannot p participate in egregious methods of investigation which clearly deprive me of my rights, then in the process attempt to conscript me to give evidence against myself and then sit back and hope that the Honourable Court will miss their unlawful conduct after time has passed and simply convict me. If the procedural steps by which these rights are implemented are not treasured and followed to the same extent as the rights themselves, then the rights do not practically exist. The necessary procedural steps that have to be taken before my constitutional rights may be infringed are outlined above and below. <coughs> Your Worship, then I deal with the, um, the dignity of an accused, um, the the constitutional right to freedom, the, um, the, um, the constitutional right to privacy, and I, um, the, my client's affidavit draws these together um, in a manner um, outlined in paragraph, from paragraph 66 following. Dignity is refracted through the prism of freedom and security of of person. The Constitutional Court has found that the right to dignity and the right to freedom and security of person impose positive duties on the representatives of the state to prevent violations of physical integrity. These and the constitutional rights which have not been mentioned, which form a part of a cluster of rights which are drawn together in, the, in a functioning whole in the criminal law or criminal procedure milieu by the entrenched right to a fair trial. The methodology which should be followed is crisply summarized in the dicta of the following cases. I then cite the cases, and as my learned friend has indicated, we can take them as read. 
This is I'm starting at paragraph 68. I do not wish to quarrel with the state representatives in this matter. By the undertakings that they have given, while I disagree that they have a case against me, the correspondence of which are annexures to this affidavit and which I incorporate into this affidavit, have sought to satisfy this court that they are mindful of my constitutional rights and that they have set aside the detailed duties they have when they, when they perform the administrative law acts they have and are about to perform, which include full disclosure of all the facts necessary to this honorable court to decide the issue of bail, have been performed in their opinion. In doing so, they have decided not to oppose my being released on bail. They have further indicated that they cannot bind the Honorable Court in the exercise of its discretion, but that they do recommend bail. I suggest to this Honorable Court that those same concessions made by the State Representatives establish the threshold for me to be released on bail. There have been major refinements of the role of prosecutor, members of the SAPS, and the role of the learned presiding officer and their respective constitutional mandates to achieve a fair trial since the inception of the interim and final constitution. These roles have been defined in delictual matters relating to unlawful arrest, malicious arrest, unlawful detention, malicious detention, negligent prosecution, and malicious prosecution. The director of public prosecutions in it should be her, sorry, um, Milady. In her defining policies relating to the prosecutorial duties and obligations, some of which are recorded above, has largely confirmed the developments contained in the latest case authority. These are the fundamental watermarks in a criminal trial. They are the decision to enroll a matter or the decision to prosecute, the decision to grant bail or not, the postponement of a matter, the diversion of a matter, the drafting of a charge sheet, the accepting of a plea by the prosecution, the stopping of a matter, the restarting of a matter, the, the prosecution's running of a trial, the withdrawal of cases, the arguing of a 174 discharge, the arguing at the end of the trial, and the sentencing phase. Each of these events requires good faith disclosure by the prosecution to the Honorable Court so that the Honorable Court may perform its constitutional mandate to ensure that the trial is fair in an informed way and the Honorable Court's inter intervention to see to it that the prosecution perform this, his or her appointed role. Disclosure plays an essential role in ensuring that the prosecution do perform in this way. In this regard, it does not make sense to make disclosure of the full docket four or five years later when a delictual matter is brought by the erstwhile accused and where such disclosure, ser such disclosure serves only to measure the quantum of damages which are to be awarded, when the financial burden on the state may be prevented, when there is common sense disclosure during the criminal trial to prevent the perpetration of the delict <coughs> in the first place. At each watershed moment, the state will have to disclose a prima facie case with an increasingly higher threshold, depending on where in the trial the alleged accused is. These are search and seizure, arrest, asset seizure, enrollment, bail, postponement, a trial within a trial, and a 174 discharge. These milestones are articulated in the prosecutor's and police's own standing orders and guidelines. These are milestones in the process of an investigation of a case which the reasonable policeman and prosecutor would consider in his or her investigation and are the objective me measures of the extent of compliance of the state witnesses with these objective standards. The material milestones canvassed in the standing orders and regulations of each consequently evidence the easily ascertained steps that a reasonable policeman and prosecutor would take to investigate a matter and are available to each to consider in planning their respective conduct before any steps are taken. A presiding officer should have to be told and satisfied that each of these steps have been taken supported by an appropriate matrix of fact before he or she makes a decision as to what method should be adopted to secure the attendance of the accused at court. These milestones have a dual function. They are the minimum standards by which the alleged accused fair trial is measured and the steps and procedures that are executed for evidence to be gathered 
so that the representatives of the state may satisfy the requirement of reasonable and probable cause. During the early stages of the trial, the apposite tests for each are aimed at securing the evidence necessary for an informed decision by the investigation officer, the prosecutor, and the presiding officer as to whether the accused should be arrested with or without a warrant and remain in detention for the purpose of securing my attendance at trial. Two contra considerations intervene. Proper investigation is done as a prerequisite to making an arrest. The next consideration is if proper investigation for whatever reason was not done prior to the arrest to justify the continued det det detention or pursuit of the trial against an alleged accused. The position had to be remedied as quickly as possible. A failure to satisfy an earlier test excludes the possibility that a later test at a subsequent stage will be satisfied. For example, if an, accused were, if an arrest was unlawful because the warrant was unlawful, this would make the enrollment of the matter unlawful, as, or, as in this case, the further prosecution of the trial which, while I remain in custody. The representatives of, uh, of the SAPs and the loaded prosecutor have to focus their minds on securing the jurisdictional facts to be in a position to explain to the presiding officer of their intention to present a prima facie case and to pursue an orderly fair trial to finality. The presiding officer must always, <coughs> has always to challenge them that this is in fact their intention. These issues, with the appropriate thoroughness, must be canvassed in the state's presentation of its evidence to show that it has a strong case rather than a weak one, so that the Honourable Court will be in a position to decide whether the method of securing my attendance at the impending trial should be secured by my detention. These steps on the state representative's version have been followed, and in the best traditions of litigation, they have assured the Honourable Court that I'm not a flight risk. <coughs> Other material considerations. I have every intention of standing my trial, should one proceed against me. I submit that I present no flight risk and that there is no reason to arrest me to secure my attendance at any trial or to ensure that I stand trial. I embrace the legal system and will abide by any finding that a court would be able to make against me. I tended to cooperate with the investigation officers and the, South a and the SAFs and to voluntarily make myself available at all hearings of the matter should the decision be taken to pursue a criminal prosecution against me. Any concerns the Honourable Court may have can be cured by conditions of bail. I will comply with these. Now, um, again, I'm going to rely on my learned friends uh, offer the subsequent cases which, are, are su which my client has read and she asked to be included in her affidavit um, justify the um, con conclusion she makes in the paragraph I've just read. Mm -hmm. Starting at paragraph 82. As I have shown, the above statute, standing orders and directives align themselves with the principles of these cases. The following must be stated. The, ev against, the evidence against me has been weighed, measured, and analyzed, and the conclusion has been that I am not a flight risk. I have a constitutional right to be released. Sorry, lady, it starts with a heading, constitutional rights. I have a constitutional right to be released to be released, um, I have a constitutional right to be released and granted bail, which right is circumcised only by my release having to serve the interests of justice and to be subject to the imposition of reasonable conditions. I respectfully submit that should this honorable court decide to order my release on bail, I'm prepared to submit to any conditions that may be imposed by this honorable court. I submit that my release on bail will be in the interest of justice which fact balanced against the fact that I do not um, pose a, a risk to, to the state should I be released on bail is a factor favoring my release on bail. I accordingly submit that the interests of justice and the considerations of prejudice and the balancing of the respective interests between the state and the defense favor the granting of bail to me on such conditions this honorable court considers fit and appropriate. I respectfully submit that I'm not financially equipped more emotionally equipped, more equipped from a health perspective, 
to deal with incarceration. I have a constitutional right to freedom, a right upon which the state, if I'm incarcerated, will be infringing unreasonably. I will be severely prejudiced by the incarceration balanced against the fact that I do not pose a risk to the state should I be released on bail in that I will stand my trial and will not interfere with any state, with any witnesses. Now, in the following paragraphs, Milady, the, my client's affidavit deals with the issue of conditions in prison. Um, I'm going to refer to the Fagan um, judgment because it's relevant to the decision that your worship will make. And then I will not refer to the other evidential extracts because they merely confirm that over time the position in, in um, His Lordship Mr. Justice Fagan's report has not improved. In pursuance of the aim of reducing the number of awaiting trial prisoners from the, fr from the present 55,285, at most 20,000, the following suggestions might be helpful. More pretrial pre diversion, especially for ju juveniles. Increased use by police of their powers to release arrested persons on bail. Wider use by prosecutors and clerks of the court of the procedure of admission of guilt and payment of a fine without a court appearance. More assistance by investigation officers to prosecutors to enable them to place adequate information before the courts for determining whether it's necessary for an accused to be detained, be detained depending trial. Extensive use of a plea bargaining <coughs> Plea bargaining in all types of cases so as to expedite matters. Greater use by the courts of alternatives to imprisonment for those awaiting trial, release on warning, bail in an affordable amount, placement under supervision of a correctional officer, official rather, electronic monitoring when it is introduced, children under 18 to be placed in the care of their parents or guardians or held in places of safety. Courts on remand dates to consider alternatives to further imprisonment. Cases of awaiting trial prisoners to be given preference over those of accused waiting trial outside prison. Consideration to be given to the ways of expediting trials of awaiting trial prisoners, for example, additional pres presiding officers and prosecutors, additional courts and Saturday courts. Withdrawal by prosecutors of trivial cases, weak cases, and cases where accused have been awaiting trial for long periods. A with withdrawn case can always be reopened. Heads of prison to be encouraged to apply for the release of awaiting trial prisoners in terms of section 63 of the Criminal Procedure Act when conditions caused by overcrowding become intolerable. Now, I'm going to take it as all the judicial services um, inspectorate reports have been read I'm going to refer, refer to um, these parts of the affidavit. At paragraph 89, in each of these reports, the chronic failings of the South African prison system are repetitively restated, namely that South African prisons are dramatically overcrowded, with most of the flaws listed in these reports emanating from this fundamental problem. South African prisons are riddled with gang activity <coughs> where gang membership breaches the divide between prisoners and officers of correctional services. Assault by inmates as well as correctional services officers is a constant threat. Membership of gangs is often predicated by the commission of an assault. Applying the concept of systemic failure, the South African prisons and the juvenile facilities do not have the facilities available to make provision for my safety and security as defined above. Activities of gangs is to organize uninvited sexual contact or facilitate the drugs trade. The chief targets of such are the old and the young. Access to ablution facilities and sanitation is totally inadequate and the lack thereof contributes to the spread of disease. Access to medical facilities is virtually non-existent due to the lack of resources and underemployment. Recently, as a result of this problem, former uh, South African President Jacob Zuma has been sent to a private medical facility and further has a medical parole. Basic constitutional rights prescribed by the law for a minimum of one hour's exercise today, exercise per day are simply ignored due to the understaffing and, and overcrowding and 
The overcrowded, overarching impression is that the South African prisons are incapable of any form of rehabilitation because correctional services staff are simply overwhelmed by, by the task of preventing inmates from killing each other. <coughs> I then deal with the issue of AIDS and the possible diet, or the likely diet, that uh, any South African prisoner will have if they go to prison. And um, the, the, my client's inference is that that is a cruel, a cruel punishment. If I may pick up at page 44 of, page 40, uh, of the affidavit. I submit that if my personal circumstances are examined and analyzed, I'm not a flight risk and that I have every reason to attend my trial. I am advised, which advice I accept, that this is not the only criterion and that a balance must be struck between the state's rights to pursue its cases and my right to be considered innocent. With, in, with this in mind, as fact, I have shown that there are various standing orders and regulations which express the administrative law requirements that rest on the soldiers of, shoulders of the SAPS and the prosecution when they decide the issues of arrest in enrollment. I have shown that if they comply with these factual requirements, the irresistible conclusion will be that I am not a flight risk and will stand my trial. I have shown out of the mouth of inspectorate judges that conditions in prison are dire and that the right of the state to pursue its cases simply does not match up to the personal sacrifices I will make, I will have to make, which would be needless in any event since I'm not a fly risk and will stand my trial. To further illustrate this point, I have set out my constitutional rights, which, is a fa which as a fact are mine, to indicate that my right to be presumed innocent the scale in my favour that it should be it would be better to secure my attendance at court by way of bail. I have also shown that the learned members of the state team have indicated that they do not oppose bail and my non and and my they do not oppose bail and support my non custodial attendance at court <coughs> and I request and pray when one bears in mind their admission there is no doubt that the interests of justice favor my release on bail. Based on the above consideration, I respectfully request that the Honorable Court release me on bail on any such reasonable conditions as it may deem fit. And once again, this is signed by my, by my client and deposed by my client on the 4th of April, 2024. Thank you. This will be handed in as Exhibit A. Um, Your Worship, if you don't mind, may I quickly take an instruction? You may. My instruction is my attorney wishes to approach my client and ask for an instruction. If I, if, if, um, you may proceed. Um, I may remind the press of our conditions discussed earlier prior to the commencement of this matter. As it pleases the court, my lady. 
there is one oversight that was made by my client's legal team when they drafted this affidavit. Um, I understand in circumstances of bail conditions that the rules of the game can be relaxed. And I'm instructed to place the following on record um, and we'll see what my learned friend's view is as to whether I can place it on record once I've placed it on record. My client suffers from hypertension. Um, now, dangerous hypertension. She is on medication called Mazubat, M-A-Z-I-B-A-T, Puricos, P-U-R-I-C-O-S, Ecotrin. Now, she constantly needs this, and if it's not made available to her, her life is threatened. Those are my instructions. I'm pretty sure my learned friend won't have an obje objection to this being made, um, this fact being presented by, from the bar, but it would be a very serious consideration in my humble submission. In view of my client's age, when your worship makes the decision as to whether to grant bail or not, as, it pleases, as it pleases the court. Advocate, your statement is handed in as Exhibit A. Is there any further evidence you are going to lead in this matter, or do you close no. your application? I close my application. I believe that the state will address every point it, as well as the last point raised. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Well, Your Worship, as I indicated in chambers, the state uh, does not intend leading any evidence. However, I wish to make the following uh, remarks regarding specific paragraphs of the affidavit. Paragraphs 4.3 and 10.2, they relate to the submissions by the applicant that the state's case is weak. My, my, my remarks are that case law is clear. When, when you apply for bail, it is an undesirable strategy to attack the strength of the state's case, particularly when you have not had disclosure of the evidence. On what basis can you say in law and in fact that the state's case is weak when you do not have the evidence. So it's just an undesirable strategy. But because as an officer of the court, I am here to ensure that this court is persuaded to grant Mrs. Mapisa Nakula bail, I am not going to make anything out of it. It's just, just a remark. For factual correctness, paragraph 15, uh, it is now uh, in the public domain, uh, a statement is circulating in the public domain that uh, the applicant has resigned as a speaker. I think when the affidavit was drafted, she had not resigned. Uh, much has been made of media reports. I'm not going to deal with that again. It is not my place. Suffice that as a lawyer, I deal with facts and law, not media reports. That is all at the stage. I then move on to give reasons why the prosecution is not opposing bail. Okay. The applicant handed herself over to law enforcement through her attorney. It, it, it is interesting, Your Worship, the last point that is not part of the affidavit, I had it noted as part of the reasons why we are not opposing bail. So, in, in, in essence, I am saying I have no objection to the, the address from the bar regarding uh, this aspect. I've noted here that the other reason we are not opposing bail is the seniority in terms of age of the applicant. And it is a fact of life that as you grow older, you, 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 you tend to have health issues. So we accept the issue of uh, the hypertension and the medication alluded to. The address of the applicant was confirmed as 
Your Worship is aware from uh, the affidavit, a search and seizure was conducted at her residence on the 19th of March uh, in the presence of her husband. So the address is, is verified. I wish to address this this way. Your Worship, I'm basing this on section 60, the considerations and case law, uh, the famous case of Lamini et al. Although there is always a flight risk of a person who is released on bail, absconding, what the law concerns itself with is the likelihood of that risk materializing. We as the prosecution cannot say that the applicant, Mrs. Mapisa Ngagula, is not a flight risk simply because the decision to abscond or not is solely on her. But what, what I can tell this court is that as the prosecution, we have no reason to believe that there is a risk of the likelihood of her absconding. And therefore, I ask the court to accept that she is not a flight risk. Those are the reasons. Thank you, sir. I took it. Uh, the state is not going to present any evidence, but uh, decided to stand with the address that they've given. Do you have think, any further address before the I, court? I do, my lady. Uh, your worship, brother. But may I just take an instant? Yes. Your Worship, may I propose this? Yes. Uh, that, that, that I address on the merits first. It, 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 I think it will be, it, it will, it will curtail the proceedings when my learned friend hears my address and then hopefully it can curtail his, his closing submissions as well. You may. Thank you. Your Worship, a, a prosecutor is an office of the court. I, I am here to assist your worship to ensure that justice is done. Having had their submissions through the affidavit, I urge this court to admit the applicant to bail. Is that all from your side, sir? Yes. Thank you, advocate. As it pleases the court, you worship it is rare your worship and I've got goose pimples going down my back it is rare that you find um, first of all that the accusatorial system works properly and I have not seen in a very long time the candor the collegiality and the wisdom of the prosecution team before you today. My learned friend has indicated that in general principle he agrees with my submissions and the contents of my client's affidavit. And he hasn't opposed bail for a, uh, for a pose sake, which once again I say is rare. Now we quarrel on detail and quarrel is actually a very strong word because we're not far apart. We quarrel on the detail of the strength of the state's case and whether there can be reliance on media reports and I want to be very careful here because I've used a too strong word quarrel and I don't want to jeopardize the wisdom that my the prosecution team have demonstrated today. My difficulty is, Your Worship, that I'm not only dealing with this honorable officer of court representing the prosecution, I have to explain to you, and I have the blank case in mind, that even if we're agreed, you don't have to. So, when I indicate 
on the information that I have available to me about the weakness of the state's case, I get to go with what's available. And what's, av what's available is press disclosures. And I'm going to press your worship to conclude that who else could have given the press this information? And then, your worship, when your worship looks at the press releases in our affidavit, your worship would approach it, I imagine, with any type of evidence which has a cautionary rule, and your, your worship would ask yourself, well, is there any corroborating evidence for what is clearly hearsay evidence? I don't have the charge sheet before me momentarily. I've lost it in my notes. Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. The evidence of the 204 witnesses we've called her, Mrs. Lovell, has been released to the press. Let's look at the corroboration. My learned friend in affidavits in the High Court has said, I'm not the one who disclosed this information. It doesn't say it wasn't disclosed. That's one fact of corroboration. Two, we've pressed your worship in your worship's discretion to decide whether there's a strong case or not. And if your worship looks at section 60, the, the, the bail section of the Criminal Procedure Act, the strength of the state's case is a consideration that you can look at. Now, I bow to my learned friend's suggestion that the case authority says that it's not appropriate. I'm not sure that that case authority is correct because the statute itself specifically says that your worship would examine the strength of the state's case. Then your worship, like in any cautionary rule, look at what was disclosed in the press, what the consequences of what was disclosed in the press are, and then, then your worship looks at what is confirmed by the prosecution team. Crucially, they confirm that they are using, and they give it two names, a 204 witness or a whistleblower witness. Now it can't be a whistleblower witness in this instance because that relates to an employer-employee relationship. So let's stick with the 204 informer prospect. So the press say, this is what the person will say, and your worship is saying in a bail application now, well, can I rely on what the press said? And I, you know, the press is in a very important estate in the South African legal system. It's the fourth estate as defined in the French Revolution and it's one of the pillars of democracy. So we have to give some weight, at least, to what is in the press. What is disclosed in the press that there is such a witness, the facts in the press are not denied, and there's corroboration out of the mouth of the state representatives that there is a 204 witness. We make the submission that that witness is not corroborated. If your worship will look at clause 6 of the charge sheet. Now we're dealing with the issue of corroboration. It reads and this is referred to elsewhere, but let's just stay with Clause 6. On or about the November 2016, the accused allegedly requested the late Secretary of Defense, Dr. Sam Gulubi, the late Secretary. It would appear from the charge sheet, and I don't want it to be disrespectful to people who've passed, this is what's in the charge sheet. I'm relying on what is in the charge sheet. It would appear from the charge sheet that he has passed. So now, now we have a dying declaration confession. If one reads the clause, clause 6, 
which is hearsay, corroborating a fraught 204 witness. So, we have to, we, we have to be in a position to persuade your worship that the case is weak. And this is what we've got. And this is why we say what we say. Having said that, Your Worship, I do not, I would, as my learned friend has, I would press Your Worship to grant my client bail, even though that you don't have to, because the state and the defense in this case are ad idem that it should be granted. The issue of the amount of bail is also a possible sticking point between my learned friend and myself. We were originally <coughs> given an indication, and I need to be very clear about this indication because I need to respect the manner in which my learned friend has conducted himself. I asked for an estimate of what they were looking for. They first declined because they said it was your worship's discretion. And then I indicated the practical problem that we need to have the funds available in cash to be paid today. So I asked them to estimate how much I should bring. That figure was agreed to be 50,000 rand. Now, um, that figure is 50,000 rand. So when your worship considers the bail amount, it is my humble submission that that amount is large enough for a now pensioner if there is a risk that she will not attend her trial, which I don't believe is there. But if your um, worship wants a belts and braces approach, my submission is that that would suffice. Um, my, my learned friend has indicated double the amount, and I would submit that that is just too much. So, once again, I ask, um, your Worship released my client on bail and on that of March. I have discussed the conditions with my learned friend and these were discussions between colleagues but I'm, I'm not sure that he would uh, take issue with my disclosing the conditions because they are the normal conditions with some, with some modification. And once again, he is generous. He suggests that the geographical limit on bail should be South Africa. He suggests that my client should would um, hand in her passport, and if she hasn't got it today, um, on a date to be decided by your worship next week, it can be provided. He has indicated that my client can travel anywhere in South Africa, but if she wished to travel overseas, she would have to give um, six months notice. And then the normal conditions of not interfering with state witnesses, etc., etc. Um, I would submit, therefore, Your Worship, that the proper order that you would give would be to grant my client bail, to give the normal conditions for bail, subject to the, the detail that I've given your worship a moment ago, and that we should all go home with a smile on this. Um, your worship, there's just one issue. I need to take an instruction from my client before I close my address, and so might I do that? Yes, you might. Thank you. As it pleases the
Patrick. My client is concerned because we budgeted for the amount that I mentioned earlier. That is all that is available now. Um, my client finds herself in the position that after all this effort, she doesn't want a practical issue of not having the funds available to get in the way. So, um, first prize for me would be that your worship grant that amount. Second prize would be, your worship, that we be given time today to raise any further amount if your worship gives a higher amount. Thank you. Your so noted. May, may I reply the before the Scott gives a ruling? Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, at this stage, the Scott has not given a ruling. I, I think it was premature for my learned friend to deal with the quantum as well as the conditions. As soon as this court has given a ruling and admits the applicant to bail, I will then address the issue of the quantum as well as the conditions, not at the stage. However, what I would like to address at the stage, it would be irresponsible of me not to reply to this. My learned friend is persisting, trying to persuade this court that the state's case is weak. As an officer of the court, I assure your worship, that is simply incorrect. I was trying to be diplomatic by saying to him, do not go that route because you do not have disclosure. I am the lead prosecutor. I know what is in the docket. It is simply incorrect that we are relying on the evidence of a single witness. Even if that was the case, our law is clear. It is competent for a court to convict on the evidence of a single witness who is satisfactory. But that is not the case. There is ample independent evidence that is corroborating the single witness who, who, who allegedly paid the gratifications. I stand here, I tell this court as an officer that the case is not weak. On the contrary, I do not want to describe it because that would be improper. Suffice to say that it is not weak. My learned friend has made a, a point about reference on the summary of substantial fact to a deceased person. We were aware. He became deceased even before we <coughs> drafted the charge sheet. However, the only point I want to make, again, I'm not preempting trial. It is permissible in our law in terms of the Law of Evidence Amendment Act 45 of 1988 to ask a, the trial court, not, not, not this court to ask a trial court to admit